Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show. Um, pick your terminology. It's up for debate for some people <laughs> what you call these things. Um, but whatever you want to call us, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We also record all of our shows, and they're posted to our website. I'll show you where that is at the end of the show. So you can feel free. You can go there and watch any of the recordings of any of the shows you've missed before. Um, the sh live show and the recordings are free and um, open to anyone to watch. So if you have any colleagues, friends, you want to see some of our shows, go ahead and point them to our website. Um, and we do um, a mixture of things here. We do um, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, uh, demos of products and software. Um, basically, our only criteria here is that it's library related. We'll put it on the show. It's a library show. Anything going on at libraries. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, and sometimes we bring in guest speakers. Um, and that's what we've done today. We've got um, over to my left <laughs> is uh, Denise Harders, who is one of our co-directors at our Central Plains Library System. Pretty much covers the center of our state, middle kind of part, middle part, top to bottom there. Yeah, <laughs> big space there. Um, and she's going to talk to us about this. is a session that she talked to me about a month or two ago, about mm -hmm. wanting to um, present on. So talking about your online identity, managing it for yourself, helping your patrons do it. Uh, just basically all the kind of things you might need to know about that. So I will just hand over to you. Um, Denise, you can take it away um, for your presentation. All righty. Well, thank you. Use either keyboard or mouse, whichever one works for you. Okay. Well, thanks, Krista. I'm really glad to be here with you today because I think this is a topic that we all think we know a lot about because, of course, we've been online for a long time. But mm -hmm. I, I do think there's still some things out there that everybody needs to know. So your digital footprint. We'll start with the definition. That one. That's okay. I just needed to get it there. Your digital footprint is information about you that can be accessed online. Now there's two kinds of footprints. Your active footprint, and that's information that you yourself have volunteered. And then there's your passive digital footprint, and that's information collected and stored by someone else. The term digital footprint actually refers to both your active and passive footprints. So that means that your digital footprint can be very revealing. And since they contain information collected and stored by other people who are not necessarily your friends, it's definitely something to be considered. Now your active digital footprint, as I said, this is information that you have volunteered yourself. Your social media account, think about Facebook, LinkedIn, and MySpace. And yes, those old accounts are still out there. Everything is still out there. Unless you've completely deleted it and gotten closed down your account. I, I know I have a MySpace account somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> I have not done anything in with in years, but I also know that I did not delete it. So, so it's out yeah. there. And your blogs or websites, if you contribute to any regularly under your own name or an easy traceable username. Um, a lot of times people write comments to newspapers, editorials, those all show up. So it's important to know that, that they still will be there. When you think about um, the personal information that you've actually posted about your relationships, your breakups, addresses, interests, your work history, your contact information, what college you went to, the parties you attended while there, any illnesses you've had when your babies are born, and believe it or not, sometimes there's even photos of the birth. So you have to be aware that you have posted, many of you and many of your patrons have posted a ton of information about themselves out there. Now, there are some fairly harmless bits of personal information that you can share, things like your age and your gender, how many brothers and sisters you have, your favorite food, your pet's name. Um, most of this type of information is stored by the website it was posted on. 
but you do want to be careful because that information can be sold for advertising purposes. Now, think about it. When you look for a pair of shoes, let's say you do a search on your favorite designer and you find a pair of shoes that you like on your desktop. You've done that search. The next time you go to Facebook, what's the ad that's right next to your feed? Mm -hmm. It's that pair of shoes. And then if you go to Amazon, there's going to be a big picture of those shoes with the price that Amazon's willing to sell them to you for. So just be aware that stuff, mm -hmm. that's the footprint aspect of this. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that's great and helpful. And to some people, that's invasive and scary. And frightening. <laughs> very, yes. very frightening. Mm -hmm. So that was just your active digital footprint. What you need to know is even though your active digital footprint contains a lot of personal information, it's not nearly as much as the passive digital footprint information is out there. There's things about your bank statements and your account information, credit scores, purchasing history. Think about it. If you buy something at particular stores, and I'm not picking on Amazon, but it's the one I know the most. It's a bookstore after all originally. But they store your credit card and debit card numbers and your purchasing histories for long periods of time. Now it is, like Krista said, very convenient when you go mm -hmm. into Amazon and you see you've saved your credit card. It's mm -hmm. really easy to buy stuff. <laughs> well, too so easy, maybe. almost <laughs> too easy. But it's it's it is a convenience. But you have to be aware that that leaves a digital footprint. Um, websites use cookies. I know we've all heard about cookies and there's been jokes and all of that, but they do track your user's browse, your browsing history and the general location. Smartphones. This is a whole new thing for passive digital footprints. Mm -hmm. You turn on that GPS. It's great to know what the weather's going to be and if there's traffic jams where you're traveling. Mm -hmm. But be aware that they track and save and broadcast your location, sometimes even when you're not thinking that that's happening. Because when it's there, it's just always on. So applications, also known as apps. Many people aren't aware when you say apps, the full word is applications. You need to, when you purchase an app or even get a free app to play a game, mm -hmm. it requests access to many things like your contact list and your messaging history. And if you really want to play the game or whoever's in charge of that phone really wants to play the game, you have to give access to it because many of them won't work properly unless you do give them the access that they request. Credit and debit card information, if you want to purchase apps, even if you want a free app, sometimes they force you into putting your credit card number in, even if what you're getting at that point is free. So, and even pictures can be stolen without the user's knowledge. Now, I recently obtained my first smartphone. My grown children tell me I'm in the dark ages. <laughs> But I did get my new smartphone. Now imagine my surprise when my phone knew that I had been searching for information on this particular presentation on my desktop in my office. Mm -hmm. When I opened my browser in my phone, the same search came up, digital citizenship. And I'm thinking, I've never searched digital citizenship on this phone, but I had on the browser in my in my office. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was Google, mm -hmm. and I use my Gmail account both on my phone and on my office computer. So that's the connection. That's how they're synced. It didn't right. occur to me. Yeah, I've had that happen too. On that, on my uh, tablet or something. Yep. If you're in the same, you have a Google account that is everywhere. It's the same thing. It's all. In the cloud? It's all synced, and, yeah. and it freaked me out in the beginning, I'm telling you. I'm one of those. 
Oh yeah. That said, what on earth? How did that happen? But then the question is, who cares? Well, online retailers and webmasters care. They want your internet browsing history. They want to increase the number of visitors to their pages. Your potential employers care. They're looking at your employment history, your criminal record, information displayed on social networking sites. They are screening applicants looking for the person that's really right for their company. So you have to be aware of that because if you share too much, they might decide that you, you're not for them. Criminals care. They love to find your credit card and your banking information, mm -hmm. phone numbers, addresses, driver's license numbers, things that are identifiable as you, and then they can <clears throat> steal your identity. And also, there's even, it's not a bad thing, but there's institutions studying human psychology. And they're out there looking for the data and analyzing it and searching for patterns, call, and they call that reality mining. Hmm. So there's a lot of people who care what's in your digital footprint. Something everyone needs to know, and I can't say this enough, your digital footprint is permanent. You, you cannot remove all traces from the internet. It's not going to happen. It can be difficult, if not impossible, for you to even find all the data that has been collected. Oh, yeah. And then, in addition to finding it, you have all the things that you voluntarily supplied through your social media accounts. And even if somehow you do find all that data and you remove what you can because it belongs to you, having it removed from third party sites is a long and difficult process. And even if the information is removed from the active websites, it still exists in the form of cached pages, which are recorded copies of old versions of websites. Removing cached pages is so difficult, I would call it impossible. So you just know that your digital footprint is permanent. So as working in libraries and working in schools, we need to teach about online identity, what your digital footprint says about you, how wide is it? Does it reveal things you want revealed? or things that you would prefer remain private. Adults that are new to the internet and children must be taught to protect their information online. The first thing you have to do is pick strong and unique passwords. Each password you use should be different. It should not be found in any dictionary. It's not your name. It's not a series of numbers. And it's really, I am still shocked to hear how many people use the word password mm -hmm. as their password. They think it's clever, but believe me, that's the first one somebody's going to try. Mm -hmm. And if any website has set you up with some sort of a default password, like sometimes um, if you're setting up an account somewhere or getting mm -hmm. set up to do like a WordPress site or something, they'll be, well, here's the one to default. And they do tell you, make sure you change something else if you're, that you want it to be. Do that. Don't accept the default password for anything. It may, be, it may seem very um, creative to start with, so maybe random numbers and letters, but it came from their system. So they right. know it now and you need to change that immediately to something else. You do. Yeah. That is because someone knows it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I have been in this position say well why can't I use my anniversary date every time because then I will remember it well you can't do that you have to have strong passwords and something that might work for you is a called a password manager or a vault sometimes I've heard them called mm -hmm. and LastPass is a company that offers this free and their slogan is that it's the last password you have to remember. 
Now there's lots of other password managers. So you, you don't have to use this one, but they all work the same essentially. What happens is, um, you know your password should look like that, but who's got time? What you do is you set up your passwords so they're really strong, and then the only password you have to put in is the one to your last pass vault. It's a simple setup, it's free. Now, it's free if you want to use it on all laptops or on all desktops or on smartphones or tablets. If you want to cross devices, there is a premium account, of course, where you can make a purchase and, and have a premium account. But then it's easy. You just choose the one for you. There's a free one. And you only have to remember that one password and it will set up profiles for places you normally shop, um, passwords for your bank, and passwords for your child's school lunch account, and all of those places where you need to have different passwords. So LastPass, certainly not the only password manager, but it is one that was recommended to one, me. Yeah. And this is something too that you can use both on your desktop and uh, port, uh, mobile device. Mm -hmm. Like it'll be the same account you can have on like if you've got a tablet and things you log into there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's it's a good option to keep your passwords strong. Now, identity theft is something that has been on the rise, and of course we all hear about it because Home Depot gets hacked, the all the different places that have lost your banking information. Something that you might want to consider is going to paperless statements it, because it helps avoid documents falling into the wrong hands because, believe me, identity theft still happens from people diving in the dumpsters oh, sure. and just picking up things that people drop on the street. They, they have many ways of finding out your information and it's not always online. In fact, a lot of times it's not. Sometimes as you look a little further down the list, it's on the telephone. Mm -hmm. So many people offer information over the phone because they, the person on the other end sounds like they know what they're doing. They oh, yeah. sound like they know I have an Apple computer and that I'm having trouble with it and they're offering to fix it for me. Okay, so then you give them all the information they need. But paperless statements, shredders, can't have enough shredders. Of course, the well-known one is you never click on links and emails from someone you don't know. It's impossible. You always end up opening some, but don't click on anything in them. And the telephone, it's, it, it's not always high tech. The rule of thumb is that you do not give out information online or on the phone that you would not give to a stranger on the street. Mm -hmm. If someone walked up to you and said, please tell me your bank account number, if you're not going to give it out there, don't give it out anywhere else. I always think of it as don't, if someone comes asking you for it and you didn't know they were going to be asking for it, like it came out of nowhere, mm -hmm. but it sounds good or they sound like they know what they're talking about, no. Take every, be skeptical of everything. It's sad that you have to, but to protect yourself, you do. Don't trust anything just because those emails look like, oh, it's probably from my, my, you know. I do have a Bank Great of America West. account. Yeah, I do. So it must be. Don't back out of that. Contact them yourself and find out. That's yeah, what I've done a, a different few times. Route. Is yeah. I reach out proactively to a number or a phone call or something to my bank or my credit card that I know is a real one because it's like off my actual card or my actual bill and say, are you guys actually doing this? Because I got this contact. Did you and, call me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you, is this really you? Yeah. 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 So now earlier I talked about personal information and there's a lot of that out there. But now I want to talk about private information. And it seems like personal information and private information should be the same thing, but it's really not. 
Private information can be used to steal your identity and should only be revealed with caution. And this is where our children in the schools need to have that designation. If someone online on one of their children's sites asks for how many brothers they have or what is their favorite color or do they have a dog or a cat, then those are all, it's personal information. It's about me, but it's okay to give that out because it's not identifying private information. So a lot oh, through the years, we've taught our children a lot of things to keep them safe, but I think they really, oops, there we go. They really need to know what is private. You never give out your full name, your street address, your date of birth. Um, of course, children don't have credit card information, but maybe sometimes they know where the credit cards are. Um, the name of your school, because it's not very difficult in this day and age to look up on the web a particular school in a particular city and find out what days they get out early and to be standing outside the fence. So personal versus private, it's very important to designate those things. Now, another component of your digital footprint is your online reputation. And in this case, when you're talking to adults, it's one thing. If you're talking to children, you explain something else to them. So we're going to start out with what you talk to adults about when you're explaining digital footprint actually even affects your online reputation. And sometimes that type of word really rings true with um, older adults in particular because they've spent their whole life protecting their reputation. And so they are, it's important to them to continue to do that. So the first thing you tell an adult is to Google yourself. Uh -huh. yep. And I did that. Came up with, and I put my name, Denise Harders, in quotations into a Google search. It came up with 1,540 results. Wow. I didn't think I was <laughs> that had that much footprint out there. Now, of course, at the very top, I didn't grab that from the screen, but at the very top, there's it gives images, mm -hmm. Google images. Pictures that might be up there. Yeah. Right. And so the first thing I saw was a picture of me, which is a shock because mm -hmm. I tend to avoid getting my picture taken if I can. I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. um, I like to be behind the camera. I don't like to be in front of it. But I actually did see two or three pictures that were me. They weren't compromising in any way. They were in, ref in activities related to my job. But then the other thing that I saw that kind of surprised me were pieces of presentations that I've done. Apparently, I had my name attached mm -hmm. to something that got uploaded, and so those pictures showed up on the images page. And then the other thing that it never occurred to me is, of course, our system has a web page. And I go out and I take pictures of librarians and libraries and activities, never children, but things that are going on in the different libraries. Well, since my name was attached to the website that those pictures were on, mm -hmm. there were pictures of librarians mm -hmm. on there too. So that didn't even occur to me. So then here are the first few results of my Google search about myself. Well, I'm on Pinterest. Yep, I know that one. That mm -hmm. one's definitely me. I'm there all the time. I use it for display ideas. I do a lot of things with Pinterest to help my libraries find activities, find uh, summer reading ideas, and do displays. So I wasn't surprised about that. Then the My Sidewalk. Oh yeah. That was something that someone called me about and offered me to go on the web and sign up. And I did 
I looked at it carefully, talked to the person on the phone quite a bit. I thought it was going to be something that would really be helpful for my libraries. Either I didn't use it correctly or something, but it it turned into one of those things I kind of forgot about. Mm -hmm. And then I also, when I was learning about things on the web, I made a Prezi, a, mm -hmm. a presentation, and it's it's nothing spectacular. I kind of forgot it was out there. But so if somebody want to look at me on Prezi, that you can pull that up. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things out there that you might have because there's so many new technologies or new websites or new services that come up. And I know I've done I probably couldn't remember all the ones that I've tried out either for myself or to teach other librarians right and then never continued with it but it's probably still out it's there still there did to me because I didn't get, get rid of it after I was exploring it and experimenting with it yeah right and then this 411 I don't know it says view my phone number and address but I think it's something that you have to pay for yeah. it says there's two listings for me I, I don't know if that's me or not, but that's mm -hmm. always going to happen if you have a phone or a, a physical address in this country. Then I look at those two obituaries, Harder's being the name of the deceased individual. Mm -hmm. And then as I looked at the names, they're, they're definitely not me, of course, because I didn't know who the person was. Right. But there's, as a little side note, in that first obituary, there is a Denise Harder's she is a younger cousin of my husband oh, and be yeah, all the Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Before the, the days of the internet, cause it was when I got out of high school and my husband and I got married and then the pharmacy mixed us up. The doctor's <laughs> office mixed us up. Uh, uh, everybody had us confused. And so I was so glad when she got married and had a married name. <laughs> then it, the confusion stopped. But guess what? We're back to it again now. They put her, it, her maiden it, name in there. It shows yeah. up under Denise Harders. So those two obituary notices, the mentions of Denise Harders, one's from Illinois. So those are definitely not me. And then, of course, the regional library systems. Yep, that's me. Mm -hmm. So as you look through it, you, it's kind of like a walk down memory lane. But sometimes those memories aren't so good. So once again, we're talking about talking to adults about their online identity. The first thing you could do in a class about online identity is have everyone Google themselves. Not that they have to share it with the class because sometimes that's not such a good thing. You don't always find positive things in your digital footprint. Your online presence is always being evaluated and it's taken into account for a lot of things. When you're applying for colleges, mm -hmm. when you're looking for a job, and even today, people Google someone they're maybe starting a new relationship with. Mm -hmm. That way, they want to know of any negative online activity. And in 2013, more than three quarters of the United States based companies actively researched online information about their applicants. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. posting negative and inappropriate comments, sharing private information, posting content pertaining to drugs or alcohol, or even making grammatical errors ah, in yes. those postings can hurt your online reputation. Mm -hmm. So be aware mm -hmm. as you're going through and as you're talking to people, what their age level is. If they're people that are applying for colleges, talk to them about what those admissions people are looking at. So when you, let's say you do Google yourself and you find things you're not particularly fond of at this point in your life and you maybe don't want your um, prospective employer to find, mm -hmm. The first thing you can do is remove any content you own. If you have an old account in MySpace if, right. and can still remember the login and password. Oh yeah. If you <laughs> if you have a, an old web journal, you know, for a while those were big, the mm -hmm. live journals. Live journals, yeah. Um, blogs, anything that you can remove that you don't like, do so. Eventually, it doesn't remove it like we talked about from those cached pages, mm -hmm. 
but they fall to the bottom. And most of the time, people don't look beyond three to five pages of Google. If they're researching you, they'll look through the first three to five pages. And if you yeah. get your stuff off of there, those cached images won't Something most like show up. Something like a a employer or a college or something, they're not going to go digging and digging. They're going to look for your most prominent um, appearance of yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah, what you've done recently. You can untag yourself from those party pictures on mm -hmm. Facebook, or if the person is your friend, you can ask mm -hmm. them to remove the image completely. Lock down those social networks by strengthening your privacy settings. Um, try and remove old email addresses. Um, and then you can strip that personal information out of your Facebook page, things that are include your education, your employment history, your hometown, those you can take out. Then you look at those settings on your social media that you do continue to use, such as LinkedIn and Twitter, in addition to Facebook, and that will help you shape your online personality and reputation the way you want to do so. Right. And a lot of this is deciding what, how you want yourself to be presented. Some of this you might want to leave out there depending on what you're trying to portray. You know, if, um, if you're trying to get a job you might want your employment history somewhere like in LinkedIn or somewhere because that's kind of the point. Right. <laughs> as right. Have it there. And maybe even in Facebook is the basics just so that if that's what you're using Facebook and people do use it for either professional purposes or personal purposes or a mixture, depending. And so you'll have to decide for yourself what is your level of comfort in mm -hmm. what you want out there and what you think you need to have out there. You know, look at it and see what you want. Um, for you, if you want Facebook just to be personal, get rid of all that work-related stuff. Don't use it for that. That's fine. I do and strengthen my, it up. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure those privacy settings right. indicate that. Right, and that's the thing, too. A lot of this stuff, and I'm not sure if you were going to talk about it, it changes regularly, too. Mm -hmm. The privacy settings that you can set on Facebook or Twitter or what you can have showing, they're always making adjustments to how it works, and so you, you can't just do this once. Right. You're going to have to go in and maintain it and double-check it six months from now or something and see, all right, did they change how privacy works on something and right. now something is showing that I didn't want it to or uh, did they add something new that I wanted to hide but I couldn't before. Right. And then you never know. It, it is important, one source recommended Googling yourself about every six months because it mm -hmm. does change. Yeah. So you need to be aware of what's still there and what is showing up new. And that part about your friends putting things up, that's something too that you don't have control over. And you might not think something new has been put out about you because you didn't do it. Somebody else might have and you didn't know it. Right. Yeah. And that's the, the really hard part about the digital footprint because there's so much content out there that you did not put out there mm -hmm. and you don't have control over it. There is... Um, a theory that if you're looking for a job or you're you want to upgrade your digital reputation that you would go on kind of a PR scan, you know run mm -hmm. you put some positive things out there um, a project that you've worked on that turned out particularly well if you're using Twitter make sure that the tweets that you send out are all of a positive nature that you're following people in the in your industry, try and get published in an online journal related to your industry. All those things that will show up ahead of the old uh, social networking sites. So that's a, an idea that you may want to improve your reputation by posting positive things, not only getting rid of the negative things. Now, when we're talking to children, that's where the terminology of digital citizenship comes in. Digital citizenship is defined, um, as I said here, that website is digitalcitizenship.net, and it's defined as appropriate, responsible behavior with regard to technology use. And that's what we need to teach the children, and a lot of times, school librarians are being asked to do these um, curriculum teaching digital citizenship. I believe it, some of the E-rate requirements um, have school yeah. librarians teaching digital 
digital There's, citizenship. In, in the new SIPA rules, Children's Internet Protection Act has for schools, not for library, not for public libraries, that they need to teach courses to the, as part in order to be in compliance with the SIPA for being filtering and protecting the kids. They need to teach some sort of coursework on um, cyberbullying, digital citizenship, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and right. that's for the on the school side. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there are a lot of um, resources on the internet. I'm going to list a few here. Digital mm -hmm. citizenship is essentially character education for the digital age. We're teaching the children digital etiquette. There's a quiz on that Brain Pop site that that lets them test and see if they're able to. Um, behave in a, a polite manner on the internet. Digital safety, of course, that's been number one from the word go. So there's tons of sites. I didn't list any ones in particular, but every website I looked at had a component of digital safety. I It just is so shocking to me when I hear a 12 or 13 year old, and I heard it just the other day again, 12 or 13 year old, was um, enticed to leave their home to meet someone that they met online. Mm. Digital safety, number one need. They're um, teaching them about copyright because, of course, so much is available on the Internet. It's really enticing at, late at night when they're trying to finish a project to oh, just yeah. copy and paste it, lift it right up out of there. So we have to teach them that the content belongs to someone else. The intellectual content, they have to know copyright basics. And believe me, copyright is complex enough. It's oh, really yeah. hard for adults. So if you can find <laughs> yeah. something that teaches kids copyright, I think that's a good thing to use. Understanding cyberbullying, like you mentioned, Krista, that's something that has come up and that makes them not a good not a good digital citizen. How do we act when we're online? Do you bully other people? And there are individuals that will cyber bully that would never consider bullying in, in person mm -hmm. because that anonymity really helps them or it doesn't help them, it causes them to feel more powerful, and so they cyberbully instead. Mm -hmm. And we've all heard the stories about what happens when too much cyberbullying happens to, to one individual. Horrible stories about mm -hmm. that. So cyberbullying is something else that has to be taught. And even basic civics. Um, Sandra Day O'Connor, the Supreme Court Justice, has a piece of this iCivics.org because so much has changed by the amount of information that is out on the internet. So our children have to be taught to behave in person, but they also have to be taught to behave online. How do you act? Mm -hmm. And that's really... Some of this could go for adults as well. <clears throat> right. Yeah. True, <laughs> and because that's where some of the problems come in is mm -hmm. with the adults. Now, another website that I know everyone has heard a lot about is Common Sense Media. I'd like to show you a little bit of how that website works. Uh-oh, I don't know if that's a link or not. No, it's oh, not. That's okay. You can just open it up and type and go to it. Um, just type it in on there. Um, one over, over, right? Oh, this one more. There you go. Yeah. Just, just open a tab here. Sure, if you want to, and type in. Yeah. So, common sense media has many aspects. They do reviews of books and movies. They have family guides, parental concerns. This is a place you can send parents who are concerned about their children 
see all the activities they have there, screen time, cyberbullying, haters, uh, privacy and internet safety. There we have the safety word again. Facebook, um, social media, cell phones even. So there's all kinds of information for parents on this particular website, commonsensemedia.org. Now when I go over to education, that's the part that I use most often mm -hmm. because the education drop down includes digital citizenship. When you click on that, there's they have three ways of delivering this curriculum and the scope and sequence is the easiest one for me. When you look at this, your digital footprint is listed here. They have kindergarten through second, third through fifth, sixth through eighth, and nine through 12. And I would say actually any of this upper level material would be usable by a library in a digital citizenship type class or in a, you know, <clears throat> maintaining your digital um, reputation. One that I looked at in particular for third through fifth graders, see it's so easy, they have so many things. That's here nice are, having it to the different levels, yeah. And here are the lessons and the power of words, that's part of your digital footprint because cyberbullying is something that you don't want to get involved in. So if you just get the PDF of the lessons, it seems like a lot of clicks. Uh oh, I can't get to the lessons. I forgot. Because I signed up, I just signed up with, um, of course, once again, it's leaving my footprint mm -hmm. with Google. And so, but when you get there, you can um, see the actual handouts that you can give to your students or children um, that come to the library. In fact, a passive program that you might be interested in is you could prepare a small poster and just ha have it say, how wide is your digital footprint? Use some of that clip art. There was so you just type in footprint. It was so funny all the different digital <laughs> clip art that you can use the free stuff with all these silly little mm -hmm. footprints. On one, the big toes were on the wrong side. I mean, their <laughs> the feet were completely mirror imaged. But anyway, you could use a clip art of footprints to draw attention to it, and then have several of these worksheets just sitting there. I'll bet you'll attract the attention of the parents for sure, but maybe some for the kids too. So there are lots of different handouts that are free. And this is another case where I actually, I made the conscious decision to sign in, to give them my information. They have my name. They don't have my address, but they, they know where I'm coming from, what library organization I work for. Um, they can see what I've done with Google, but it was a conscious decision. And that's part of this because we can't go off the grid. We can't stop yeah. living. We can't stay out of the internet because that's the way we live now. Right. So we have no choice. But when you think about it, the initiatives that the schools are are doing now one to one they have they're handing tablets they're putting laptops in everyone's hands and it started out only at the high school level but now they are giving those out at middle school level some mm -hmm. of them even into the upper elementary so with all those initiatives going on in even the most rural schools and actually the the bigger schools are sometimes less likely to do that one-on-one -on -one initiative so in our area here in nebraska we have a lot of rural schools and they are going one-to-one -one with all the different devices and digital citizenship could be the most important subject of the day and that's being taught by the school librarians most of the time 
So there mm -hmm. needs to be some different resources available and all those mm -hmm. that I listed on the page before. And I had a, a list of references that I accidentally clicked because I was trying to click yeah. on common sense. Media. You can go back to it and go back a slide if you want to go back oh, to can the I? point. Yeah, go there and then just do. There we go. Oh, is there it is. Yeah. Yep. So I used um, a lot of the or all of the resources I used came from the Nebraska Access. Um, uh -huh. The, the, databases. the new databases, and I use the one that searches a whole bunch all at once. Mm -hmm. So I was practicing what I learned at the Database Roadshow. Nice. And I Susan found... Susan and will be happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I found so many things using that Nebraska Access mm -hmm. database that I, I couldn't even believe how much information I yeah. found. So it looks like I'm wrapping up a little early, yeah, but no do problem. we have any questions? Um, let's see. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, go ahead and type them into your question section of your GoToWebinar interface. I'm uh, monitoring that here. Um, if you have a microphone, we can unmute you. Um, but I will let you know um, if for any of these resources. Um, the PowerPoint presentation that Denise has used here, I've got a copy of that. It's going to be included when we put up the recording, so you have access to all the slides. Mm -hmm. um, any of the websites she's mentioned, I've already added to um, the Library Commission's Delicious account, where we save all websites. Um, bookmark them all in there, so you'll have access to that. And I'll add links to all of this information, too, here, um, well, as best I can. I know they're within our databases for here in Nebraska, but um, we'll have the information out there for anyone who can get to them online. So in the recording, you'll have everything you need, hopefully. <laughs> Let's see. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and type them in. Nobody had any questions during. No questions. No? Okay. <laughs> um, well, it is just a, it's, I have been surprised, like I say, just by how many of my devices seem to know each other. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. my age, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it has been a shock to understand that if I search for something in the office, then it's going to show up on mm -hmm. my phone. Yeah, if you're logged in, if you have that same Google account open, then it can track what you're doing and then carry it over to your other devices. Yeah, there's a lot of that connection. Um, some people do try to control that, and I'm, I've never tried myself by it. Whenever you're done with something or whenever you want to do something that you wanted to keep private, you can log out of all of your accounts that might be tracking, log out of your Google accounts. That's one of the main ones that you mm -hmm. can connect around along. And then you can't know what you're doing if you're not actually logged into it. Right. There's ways you can make your, and I'd have to look up, you'd have to look up, the, make your searching anonymous so that it can't be tracked. Right. Um, yeah, I saw a lot of that takes, stuff. That's that, a whole other level of <laughs> paranoia. Training. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that too. <laughs> um, but just being aware, I think that's the key. The way you said, just know that this stuff is out there and that it exists. So many people, like you said, um, people new to media, maybe older people and new kids who you know, everyone thinks, and I personally hate the phrase. Digital natives. Digital natives. No, it's yeah. not a real thing. It's a phrase made about all these people of a certain age. That doesn't mean they inherently know how all this works. They don't you have can't. the special they don't have set the of knowledge. knowledge. No, they don't magically know how to use all of this. It doesn't work that way. They need to be taught as well, and they just don't know. Um, we do have a couple of things here. Oh, a question. Um, ah, that's a good question. Um, someone asked, if you know that you're not the only person with the same name, same exact name as yours, should you warn a prospective employer? that if they do Google search you, that some of the things they find might not be you out there. Yes. Um, I, I would, yeah. because when it was talking about Googling yourself, they said if, if you're uh, Sue Smith, oh, gosh, yeah. that you may want to add something, such as your um, location, maybe your state even, or your, mm -hmm. or your community's name to that search to, to limit the amount of hits that you get and to maybe see what actually does pertain to you. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're really out after that good job, I would up front say, when you search this, you're gonna find some things. But it's not. But it's yeah. not all me. Mm -hmm. And even if it is you, this was recommended too, even if it is you and you don't have any way of getting rid of it, like if you really it's blasted your last employer on some kind of a blog and you can't get rid of it 
maybe a little bit of advance warning to the people you're talking to about a new job. You could give them the background for that if there's some kind of extenuating circumstances. Mm -hmm. Preemptively explain this is what this is what on, prompted or, that, yeah. and or even if it's something about yourself, or you know, you were going through a tough time, mm -hmm. something was happening in your life, in your personal life that didn't necessarily show up, but that prompted you to behave differently than you do now. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, something that came up too. Was yeah. just be forthcoming. Just yeah. say, I know that you're going to search me, and right. we're going to find some good things. But there was this one thing, you know, tell them, tell them mm -hmm. Be it's honest. better. Yeah. And then don't assume because you, you had the statistic there of how many employers actually do three this. quarters more are doing and more. It's going to go up, only going to go up, <laughs> only number. going up. Yeah. You have to assume they're going to don't hope they don't 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 mention it. Don't not mention it because they don't they're not going to tell you they're going to do this. It's right. just part of the process now, just like contacting your references who you've mm -hmm. actually told them to contact. Right. Um, they can actually now contact anyone they might want, potentially, but they can find other stuff out there as references, these digital, your digital identity out there. Mm -hmm. And if, yeah, if there is something, I think that is a good idea. Just say, you're going to find this thing and this is what was going on. Or you're going to find this other person. Yes, we have the same name, but you'll note that they live in Alaska. I yeah. don't live in Alaska. That wasn't me, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So just so you're aware, you know, don't take. You'd hope, but you got to understand too, who, just like we're talking about teaching this kind, how to use this. Not all the HR people might be as um, as expert at searching as you might think. Right. And they may blindly look at things and say, oh, well, they did this thing in Alaska and robbed a bar or something, so yeah. let's not hire them. Not thinking about or not realizing, well, maybe it wasn't really it's not that. You. <laughs> you know, look at the photos that are related to it. See if it is the same person. I look at myself and there's tons of different things out there. And but amazingly looking at my name in, like you said, in quotes, cause yeah. it's just me and photos that people, multiple people have the same exact name. I know. And I like, not me, not me. Well, that one is. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. 1,500 That's crazy. hits yeah. on my per, my name, Denise Harder's. That's not all you. No. That's not all me. <laughs> Might make you feel really <laughs> popular, but it's not. Yeah. 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 So that's definitely a good question, good idea. Um, and we do have a question in uh, or an answer to the question about how to um, browse the internet um, anonymously. Um, something you can do in Chrome, if you're using Chrome as your browser, you can um, open what they call an incognito window, a separate tab that is mm -hmm. um, that you can be, and then it does not track what you're doing. So if you do want to keep some of your searching, like you said, how it links, um, that is something you can do too. So you can look up information about that. Um, and it's going to be like this says it's specific to Chrome. It's going to matter which browser you're using may have different features for doing that as well too. And they said very specifically, use something other than Google because Google mm -hmm. and Bing both oh. are designed to sell you things. Mm -hmm. So that's why so many of your websites show up with ads that seem like this was made for me. Mm -hmm. That's Google and Bing's work. You can use, there's, there are browsers that don't mm -hmm. keep other search engines that don't. Yeah. History. Mm -hmm. And those are things that it's, if you put a, a search into a database of magazines, I'll bet you will find mm -hmm. several names yeah. that you could, like you, can, you say, you anonymous keep, browsers. Yeah. That's what I'd put yeah. in. If that's something that you're bothered by, there's ways to get around that. Yeah. And use use something besides mm -hmm. Google. Yeah. And it just depends on what you're searching for and what you are comfortable with being out there. If it's something that you're not bothered by that, you know, you think it's useful that I was sort of looking for shoes and now it's giving me other shoes that look like this one. That's exactly what I wanted. Thank you very much, Google. But if you don't like that, then do something about it to make sure that it doesn't. Yep. You know, they're putting these, they put these features we'll call them, yeah. into their browser and everything to try and help you. But not everybody agrees that, that it's helpful. Well, it's like the location yeah. thing, you know, if you mm -hmm. need to find a restaurant, oh, yeah. if you need to find a gas Traffic station, and directions, oh, I all use of that, that all the time. is, yeah. it's a convenience. We all use mm -hmm. those. I was getting turn by turn directions mm -hmm. to someplace in Omaha last week. Which so. meant they had to know where you were 
and it's not anonymous. Mm -hmm. It's where you they yeah. had to know where I was to give me those directions. Mm -hmm. So so you gotta give sometimes give some of your privacy out there to get these these get benefits what you want. if you want to. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like any other urgent questions have come in, and we've just hit 11.01 on my clock, so okay. nobody has any other um, desperate things you need to add right now. I think we could wrap it up. Thank you very much, Dee. This was great. I'm glad you did this, especially for some people that maybe having people using their computers that they know really should be told some of these things. They don't know how to tell them. This would be very useful. I think a lot of these resources, and especially the definitions of exactly what kind of what these different footprints are and mm -hmm. your identities and everything, I think would be very helpful. So thank you very much. I'm going to switch back over to our, here where I was. Um, so yes, that will wrap it up for today's show. Get back there. Um, it's being recorded and it will be posted here. This is our Encompass Live website. Um, right here at the bottom, Archive Encompass Live Sessions. We post all of our previous sessions here and I believe last week, yeah. We'll have the recording out to our YouTube account. Um, presentation will be on our um, slide share account here at the Library Commission, and the links will be in our delicious account, all these online places that we use um, for the commission. So um, we'll have that posted up there. I'll let you all know when it is available. Get back in the page. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's topic. Um, I hope you join us next week where our topic is board in the, board in the stacks, <laughs> developing a board game collection for your library. Um, this is specifically doing um, board game collections and events for adults in public libraries. Mm -hmm. So having, you know, it's not just a kid's thing, and I'm sure many of you, I do it. We have we have gaming nights at our house, or we go to a friend's house, all sorts of different kind of board games are out there now. Um, we had a session last month or the month before about doing an event in an academic library. Mm -hmm. um, and now here's the same kind of thing coming from on the public library side. So if you're interested in doing that in your library, um, definitely uh, log in or sign up for our session next week or any of our other upcoming shows. We have them all listed on here. Um, September's all booked up. I've got some coming for October, so keep an eye on here for new um, topics coming up. Also, if you are a big Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook. Go ahead and like us over there. You will get notifications um, of when shows are coming up here every, every Wednesday. I remind people they can log in on the fly if they haven't pre-registered to our shows. And when our recordings are available, I post up here as well. So when, this, when uh, today's recording is done, you'll all put a message up there too. All right. Other than that, that will wrap it up for this morning. Thank you very much, Denise, for coming and joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we will see you next time on, on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.